Today we are going to study the chapter on immunity which is the 11th chapter and this 11th chapter is part of the AS syllabus and the syllabus code for this is 9700 and we are going to study how the body how the body protects from diseases. So why is it that when there is somebody in the class who has a flu and is sneezing, uh, but the rest of the students do not get it, maybe one or two do get it even, but the others don't get it and especially in these days when we are uh, seeing a lot of coronavirus uh, around us and the COVID-19 affecting all of us, some of us get the infection and they get a very severe infection while some of us get a very mild infection. So basically it's the immune system which is uh, playing a very important role and for us to understand the immune system we need to know the chapter on immunity. First of all we are going to study the topic on phagocytosis. In phagocytosis first we've got to understand is that whenever there's injury like you cut yourself or you know, something pricks you or a mosquito bites you some sort of injury <clears throat> so the body cells are damaged and they release a chemical which is called histamine. Now this histamine results in, we have this very important white blood cell which is called a neutrophil. And a neutrophil is a type of a phagocyte and this has the ability to move out of capillaries. This is the only cell which can move out of the blood supply or the blood vessels. So it can move out of capillaries. Why capillaries? Why not arteries and veins? Because arteries and veins are very thick walls. And the capillary is only the one which has a single cell. It has a single cell wall. So this phagocyte can move out or this neutrophil can move out of this capillary. And this whole phenomena is called phagocytosis. So the neutrophil moves out and when it moves out, I said moves out of the capillary, now why does it move out because it's attracted by this chemical and this chemical is histamine so whenever there is movement because of a chemical that is going to be called chemotaxis chemotaxis taxi means movement and chemo means a chemical so this movement of the neutrophil out of the capillary is called chemotaxis. So it's going to move out of the capillary and that is called chemotaxis. Now as you can see here uh, this is the capillary and inside the capillary you can see how the neutrophil this is the neutrophil and it can move out of the capillary and it moves out by a movement which is called amoeboid movement just like an amoeba moves and it can move out of capillaries. Now please remember this is happening where there is any damaged tissue. Now wherever there is damaged tissue, like for instance you have cut your hand or uh, you know some, a pin has pricked your uh, hand and uh, this phagocyte or this neutrophil is going to move out of the capillary and it's going to, now the green is the bacteria or can be any pathogen, can be a virus even and it's going to move out and engulf now the word that we want you to use is engulfs. So it engulfs the pathogen and then of course it becomes a part of it and then it becomes, this of course will become the phagocytic vacuole. So the phagocytic vacuole will engulf the bacteria or the pathogen and this phagocytic vacuole now is part of the phagocyte. Now what is also present in the phagocyte are the lysosomes. Now the lysosomes get attached to this phagocytic vacuole. Now it will be called a phagolysosome. Now it will be called a phagolysosome. Now you remember that the lysosome contain hydrolytic enzymes. So the hydrolytic enzymes will be released. And once the hydrolytic enzymes are released, they will digest they will digest the bacteria because you have to remember is that the bacteria contains the cell wall which is made up of 
peptidoglycan so if there is any enzyme which can digest the peptide part and the glycogen part then of course the bacteria is going to be digested and destroyed so an overview of it is in phagocytosis first there is going to be chemotaxis the neutrophil is going to move out number two is going to engulf the pathogen engulf the pathogen then it's going to uh, lysosomes are going to release enzymes pathogen digested and destroyed pathogen digested and destroyed but in doing so this neutrophil also dies so whenever you have some sort of infection and you have pus in it the pus is actually dead white blood cells so what we have to understand is that the phagocyte of course is protecting you from invading pathogens but in doing so it is also dying so it gave up its today for your tomorrow topic is B lymphocytes the next topic is B lymphocytes in which we are going to talk of B. Why B? Because these lymphocytes were produced in the bone marrow and they also mature in the bone marrow. We will be also talking about a T lymphocyte. Now the T lymphocytes, the difference is why is it a T? Because the T lymphocyte actually is produced in the bone marrow but it matures in the T for thymus. Not thyroid, thymus. It's in front of the neck, this gland, which is called the thymus gland. Now, the B lymphocytes have a very important phenomena to uh, undertake is that they will protect you from diseases. So, when a measles virus enters your body, it has antigens on its surface. Now you have to understand what are antigens and I always say antigens are like surface markings. It's like your face ID. So everybody has a specific shape of the face and the nose. So his face ID is the antigen. So there will be a virus with this antigen, maybe another virus with a different type of an antigen, something like this on it. So there are different strains of the virus. But in measles virus has a specific antigen on its surface. Now when this virus enters your body, God has been kind to you and given you different B lymphocytes. And this is that array of B lymphocytes which I have drawn here. B lymphocytes. There's one, two, three, four, five, six which I have shown you here. But of course you have many, many, many more. You have millions of them. Now when a virus enters, one of these is going to be selected. Why is it going to be selected? This one is going to be selected. Why is it going to be selected? Because this antibody receptor is complementary to this antigen. So this specific B lymphocyte will be selected. Now when this is selected, the first step I've said is selection. The next step is cloning. So the millions of copies of this B lymphocyte are going to be made and that is called cloning. I said millions of these copies will be made. So the first step is selection, the second step is cloning, and the third step is differentiation. In differentiation, what you can see is that some of them will become the memory B cells. And these will stay in your system lifelong in some cases, in some cases for a short while. And some of them, the others will become plasma B cells. And these plasma B cells, P for plasma and P for produce, so will plasma B cells will produce antibodies. They will produce antibodies. And what the antibodies will do is they will go and attach to the surface of this virus and then will somehow help in destroying it. So we're going to talk about that in a little later, but I'm just going to recap this. Number one, this is called the humoral response. First of all, the virus enters one specific lymphocyte is selected. Why is it selected? Because it has 
it has an antibody on it which is complementary to the antigen. Antigen is the surface markings on a virus. Then this particular lymphocytes will copies will be made. So number one selection, number two cloning, first selection, then cloning, and then differentiation. Differentiation it means that the millions of copies which have been produced, some of them will remain as memory B cells and some of them will convert into plasma B cells and these plasma B cells will produce antibodies. Now when this virus has entered your body, the lymphocytes have made antibodies. The antibodies come and get attached to them. And these antibodies circulate in your blood and your lymph. And now what is it going to become easier? It's going to become easier for the phagocyte to engulf it and digest it and destroy it. Engulf, digest and destroy. Now the antibodies have marked the pathogen. So these antibodies have marked the pathogen and the antibodies now is going to become easier for the neutrophil and on the cell membrane of the neutrophil, there are surface receptors where these antibodies can get attached. And it becomes easier for the phagocyte or the neutrophil to engulf, digest and destroy it. Now we study the structure of an antibody. Now an antibody is a glycoprotein. So if it is a glycoprotein, it will have to have the uh, cells which make it, which is the plasma B cells, will have to have a large number of Golgi bodies and also will have to have a more intensive RER because you see the fixed ribosome make the proteins which need to be exported out of the cell. So more RER and more Golgi body. Now I said an antibody is a glycoprotein plus I also say that it is a globular protein. So if I say it is a globular protein that means that it's got the hydrophilic R groups on the outside and the hydrophobic R groups on the inside. So I said it's a globular protein. It's also a glycoprotein and it's also a globular protein. And it also has a quaternary structure. It also has a quaternary structure and it is made up of it is made up of four polypeptide chains. So what we need to understand is that it is number one I said it's a globular protein, number two I said it's got a quaternary structure and it is made up of four polypeptide chains. Please remember you are going to very soon compare it with hemoglobin. So four polypeptide chains and there are two types. This one and two are called the heavy chains and the three and four are called the light chains. The one and two are called the heavy chains and the 3 and 4 are called the light chains. Light chains because they will have less amino acids in them. Please remember, I just said it's a quaternary structure. So it's a protein. It is made up of polypeptide chains. So it's made up of 4 polypeptide chains. But there are of 2 types. Similarly in hemoglobin, remember, there are 2 types. So antibodies have an area which is called the part of the antibody molecule is the constant region. Constant region means that it is present in every antibody and it is the same in every antibody. But then there is another part which is called the variable region. This part is called the variable region because it's going to vary in different antibodies. Now you can see that it's got a different shape. Now of course on both of them it has the same shape. But this is where, this is what you've got to understand is this is where the pathogen which has a antigen which is complementary to this is going to fit in here. 
So if this is the virus, only that shape of the variable region which is complementary to it will fit. Uh, now this is a diagram of uh, an antibody and you can see that there are these disulfide bonds which hold the chains together. And then there is a carbohydrate part which is attached here. That's why we said it's a glycoprotein. And this area we call the antigen binding site. That is where the uh, virus is going to fit in with a specific antigen on its surface. And that is, that's why called the antigen binding site. Now the important thing is that the amino acid sequence and hence the shape of the binding site is different in each type of antibody. And you can see these different diagrams in which the antibodies are attaching to the pathogen because on the surface of the pathogen are all these antigens which of course will only attach to a specific antibody. That is why when you, when we make you a vaccine, we, uh, whenever we make you a vaccine, we actually give you weakened or dead pathogens. Now what we are doing is we are making a fool of the immune system and we expect them to go into thinking that the pathogen is not dead so it keeps on making antibodies again and then doing so it will also make memory cells. So when the actual li live pathogen, the real one will enter, you will have the antibodies and you will not develop the disease. But in the case of the measles virus, if person has suffered from measles once in his lifetime, well he's not going to get it again because he has the plasma B cells. The plasma B cells will make antibodies when he's suffering from the disease. But when he's recovered from the disease, he still has the memory B cells. Now the memory B cells remain in your system for life. So whenever that virus enters again, the memory B cells will become plasma B cells and will make antibodies and destroy the virus. So you will not suffer from measles again for a second time in your life. Now this is a very typical graph uh, that we often give you in the exams to see if you've understood it. Now we say this is called the primary immune response to antigen A. So you can see how the exposure to the antigen occurred on day one or day two and then of course we see after a few days when the selection and the cloning has taken place, the antibody concentration rises and it rises and then it falls. But then if you have a second exposure to antigen A, then of course it will rise even further because now you already have the memory B cells and then it will of course settle down. But then if you say it was exposed on day 28 to antigen B as well, but the B starts a little later because antibodies to B will start a little uh, after a few days because that's the selection and the cloning process has to take place. So you can say one is called the primary response and then one is called the secondary immune response. And this was the primary response to antigen B. So please understand this. This graph is a very typical graph that we give you. Primary means the first one and secondary means the second one, the second time that you were exposed to the same antigen. So in a vaccine what we do is we give it to you, we give you the weakened or the attenuated uh, virus and then of course the primary response takes place and then a month later we give you a booster dose. Now the booster dose is for this very reason because we expect you to have a secondary response and that of course will result in a higher level of the antibody. So the antibody levels are higher and then the antibodies levels remain higher so that then you have the immunity to that and you do not develop the disease. The next uh, topic that we don't talk about is active immunity and passive immunity. It looks like an English class an active voice and passive voice but of course that's not the case. In biology, we talk of active immunity. Active immunity means when your lymphocytes, when your lymphocytes perform some activity. Now, when your lymphocytes have performed some activity, the first example is natural active immunity. In natural active immunity, what you have to understand is, in natural active immunity, the person has suffered from some disease. Like for instance, 
in this case the example that I give you is that you have suffered from measles you have been sick for say about 10 days you have missed school and now you have recovered And now you have recovered. So when you have recovered, now you have immunity from that disease. You will not suffer from measles for the rest of your life. Now what has happened is that the virus enters. So you have had antigenic exposure. You have had antigenic exposure. means that you have been exposed to the virus with a specific antigen on its surface. So you've been sick for 10 days, you've of course developed the plasma B cells and the memory B cells and you have been sick and then you have recovered. Now this is called natural active immunity. So the example is that when you've suffered from a disease and you've recovered from that disease, that is called natural active immunity. The other case is artificial active immunity artificial active immunity again your lymphocytes will perform some function but why is it artificial is because we have given you we have given you some sort of a vaccine we have given you a vaccine vaccine means we've given you like an example is uh, the polio the polio vaccine which we give you in the form of drops. Now what have we done is we have actually given you the dead polio virus which probably has some sort of antigen on its surface. And then when we have given you these polio virus in the form of drops your lymphocytes have made antibodies against it. So they have made antibodies against it and actually it's not when even living but it's dead so they're just killing another killing a dead virus and then these antibodies have developed against it but in this process what has developed is the memory B cells. So when the actual live polio virus enters your body, God forbid, then you are not going to suffer from polio. The reason why we are so much uh, against polio is because polio causes mm, damage to the motor neuron of the spinal cord. And that of course results in a permanent disability lifelong. So the person limps. So that is why we like you, we are trying all these programs these days of giving you the polio drop so that this is a polio free world in the next 10 years. So natural active immunity and artificial active immunity. Natural active immunity and please remember I just said your lymphocytes have to perform this activity. So in the first case, the actual you've suffered from the measles, you've been sick for 10 days, you've missed school and you've recovered. In the second situation, none of this thing has happened. We've just given you the dead virus, but then your lymphocytes think is the real live virus when they've made antibodies against it and they have of course developed the memory cells and then the memory cells remain in your system. So when the real live if ever, God forbid, the live virus enters, you will not suffer from the disease. The next one we talked about was active and passive immunity. Now, passive immunity is again of two types, natural and artificial. In natural passive immunity, what you have to understand is that the virus enters and as, it's, as I told you a little earlier, it contains antigens on its surface. And what we result in making is antibodies. Now, in passive immunity, what is going to happen is antibodies are going to be transferred, not antigen. So, there is no antigenic exposure. In natural immunity, a woman has suffered from some diseases like she had measles or something and she has these antibodies in her system and she passes them to the fetus. When this woman is pregnant, she passes them to the fetus and when this baby is born, he or she has these antibodies and these antibodies can be of different diseases. So all these antibodies which the baby has protects this child 
from diseases because he already has these antibodies. But please remember, in passive immunity, the antibodies have not been made by your lymphocytes. They've come, your mother's lymphocyte has made them. So they've come either in breast milk or across the placenta. And these antibodies are going to protect the baby, but it's only going to be a short-term immunity. Why is it going to be short-term? Because your lymphocytes has not made them. It's your mother's lymphocyte which has made them. So they're going to be there for a short while and they will protect the baby from at least what six months to a year from uh, any diseases which the child might suffer. In artificial passive immunity, now this one is artificial passive immunity. In this, of course, what we do is we make some antibodies in the lab and then we give it to the person in the form of an injection. Now, this is done when, God forbid, you fall on the road uh, and you injure yourself and you cut your skin and you bled. Then we think maybe tetanus, the pathogen for tetanus has entered your body. So, we give you ready-made antibodies against the tetanus pathogen. So these anti-tetanus whatever is called, this injection is going to be for a short while. Of course now they last a little longer but previously they only lasted for six months and now they last for a little longer. So you will go and have the injection and what was the injection? In that injection which is a very small amount uh, of the liquid contains millions of antibodies against the tetanus bacteria. So all these inject, suddenly when you get the injection, you have millions of these antibodies against it. And when you have millions of these antibodies against it, so God forbid if the tetanus bacteria has entered your body, you have the antibodies to destroy it because you will not suffer from the disease tetanus. Tetanus is a very, is a very, very uh, painful and a very uh, deadly disease. So we don't want you to suffer from it. And plus we cannot give you the weakened tetanus bacteria because it can, we have not been able to make it weakened and we have not been able to give you some sort of another, the artificial active immunity. So this is called artificial passive immunity because we have given you ready-made antibodies. We don't give you the weakened antigen or the weakened virus. We give you ready-made antibodies which are of course going to attach to the pathogen and then of course the phagocyte is going to engulf it and destroy it.